It's June 12th, another Friday, Friday evening, uh, about a week away from the midsummer, the time of our greatest joy in the vineyard with the longest, the longest days. Uh, this chapter is going to be, it's chapter 40. It's called A News Name Marcy. And it's about the Grenache vines here. Here they are. It's just a beautiful, beautiful block of vines. Uh, part of it overlooks the Pacific. Uh, there you go. You can see see the vines, the grapes, the hillside. Uh, it's really wonderful. Um, it being Friday happy hour, we have uh, one of our uh, blue, blue iritas, um made from our own oranges. You don't need triple sec because the oranges are so sweet. So let's get started. Chapter 40. A muse named Marcy. With the house and Grenache block cleaned and everything in place for the last harvest. Late that afternoon, Paul showered outside, scrubbing his body with sea salt to remove impurities from his skin and soul. After he was dry, he splashed his entire body with Vineyard Man, an eau de cologne the Saint Sommelier concocted with him in mind. He dressed in a new white shirt, white pants, white socks, and new white tennis shoes. Sheila asked as he walked towards the door, Why are you wearing white to pick grapes? It's a ritual sacrifice. With Bluey by his side, he strode up the stone walkway to the gateway arch of the Grenache block to begin the family pick when it was only he, Bluey, and Sheila, a quiet time at dusk before the storm of pickers arrived at dawn, when the family could enjoy the serenity of grapes by themselves without the commotion of a harvest party. Paul heard Jane's voice call from a towering cloud, Bootlegger, break a grape. I'll crush them all, and lightning flashed as he looked up and discerned her face. Paul unfastened the veil from his favorite vine, beheld the beauty of her luscious grapes, then slowly, gently defruited her and the harem of her sisters until he found himself weeping by the light of the moon. He carried buckets of grape down downhill to safely sleep outside the winery as the cool marine layer crawled in, and shrouding the vineyard in fog. Paul went inside, drank a glass of Grenache wine to celebrate the first, fruits, the first fruits of the last harvest, set the alarm for 4 a.m., and tried to rest with dreams of Marcy disrupting his sleep. They met on a flight from London to San Diego. Paul, who didn't drink and fly unless it was with Dom Perignon, requested water, while the young woman next to him ordered Chardonnay. Since Paul had an abundance of free drink tickets, he offered her one to pay, to pay for her wine. No matter drinks were free on the international flight, his gesture broke the ice. He, she was a senior at San Diego State University on the six-year plan, 24 years young, at their recent high school reunion. Rachel complained about a classmate who hit on her college-age daughter accompanying her. The nerve of him, said Paul, who now found himself engaged in animated dialogue with a college student, albeit 24, who was cute. Marcy worked at Bootlegger's Bar in San Diego's Gas Lamp, where tips were generous, allowing her to pay her way the last three years of college, the family payment plan having expired. They spent ten hours together in non-stop conversation, and Paul, ready for a drink when they landed, suggested they catch a beer at Bootlegger's. Bootlegger's porch rolled onto the sidewalk. Inside, a sports bar with large flat screens was within spitting distance of any patron. More beer taps than keys on a piano were servers. Invariably young ladies wore short shorts, shamelessly tight, shaping their buttocks to appeal to patrons' interests, some period. Bootleggers was hopping, and since they were short-handed, the, the manager asked Marcy to jump in and assist. Paul saw Marcy transformed after she changed clothes and went to work, serving customers quickly, expertly, with a smile. No wonder she made so much money from tips. He was over twice her age, and when he saw her, acted twenty-something again, and as work tapered and the clock approached 11 p.m., he asked, Have you ever been to the Casbah? All the time. I've wanted to go my whole life, but have never been. Let's go. And they headed to San Diego's iconic rock and roll music nightclub and danced two hours, which for Paul was a half marathon. 
he a willing runner, a greyhound led by a rabbit. At closing, they walked outside, and he gave her the gentle embrace a father gives his daughter, mentioning the harvest at summer's end. And she followed Bluey's Instagram account, admiring scenic photos of vineyard life. Though her friends at the bar teased her for dating her father, she enjoyed Paul's company that day, accompanying a man with a mature outlook, not interested in a quick hookup. Paul didn't need an alarm. She led banging pots in the kitchen before dawn. She stayed up all night cooking for the volunteers, proving once again, nothing is more expensive than free. Next year, let's just have one harvest, Sheila pleaded. That's a good idea, said Paul, not reminding her it depends on the grapes. He knew it was almost a mathematic impossibility for all their varietals to ripen at the same time. Without ceremony or bubbly, with the desire to bring the grapes home before starting the party, Paul greeted guests at the property's entrance with clippers and buckets and sent them uphill to start picking. He saw a bad hombre wearing a black hat and a patch over his eye approach. Buenos dias, senor. What brings you here, pirate? I heard you need help. We have it covered. I am here. I might as well help. Could you buy three bags of ice for the ice chest? That's a job I can handle, amigo. When Miguel came back with the ice, Paul handed him a beer and asked him to help lift grapes into the crusher when the time came. Don't spill any beer into the grape juice. I don't want our wine infused with essence of Corona. Since when can you smell? Since you guys shoveled all that compost in my face and I sneezed. Marcy apologized for arriving late and asked, When are we going to stop stomp the grapes? After we pick them, said Paul. We put them into a machine called a crusher de stemmer that removes the stems and gently breaks their skin without crushing the seeds. You mean we're not going to stomp them with our feet? She asked, Paul hearing the disappointment in her voice. For you, my dear, we will stomp grapes. Yay, I'm so excited. But first, you need to go help pick. Let me show you how. He gave her clippers and on Sheila's pinotage vines at the bottom of the hill. He took her hand and showed her how to carefully lift the bottom of a cluster and took her other hand and showed her how to snip the cluster with clippers at the woody part attached to the cane and to place the cluster carefully into the bucket. Bluey, take Marcy to the ganache. And the herder nudged the little lamb who skipped up the hill to the grapes. Marcy was a great addition to the picking crew, donning purple running shorts and sandals with purple toenails brighter than grape juice. Athletic, she was a good picker, working the steep ledges of the Grenache with the agility of a bighorn ewe on narrow ledges that dropped to the valley. Bluey liked what he smelled, and she was great with the dog. Marcy made the last harvest of the season as exciting as the first. Picking grapes was fun again, and, and Paul, with an extra spring in his step, picked more than Sheila. Why don't you start crushing so we finish sooner, Sheila suggested to Paul. Today, we're going to stomp the grapes with our feet. That's dirty. It's cleaner than a lot of other things in the vineyard that touch grapes. You should try. Do it yourself. She was angry because, because the day was meant to be her triumph, the glorification of the grapes, the day she reaped the harvest from her precious babies. But Miguel, that rascal, had unexpectedly showed up, pillaging her vines. I want to hurry up and finish. After stripping the vines, they gathered around the crush pad for a toast and to recite excerpts from the Liturgy of the Vines, a copy Paul kept when the bishop blessed the baby vines years earlier. To renew his covenant with the vines, Paul read at every harvest, if not aloud, then to himself. Let us pray. Dear Lord, you are the one who blesses us with abundant life. You are the one who brings the seasons by which seed is planted matures, and harvested. We give thanks for today's bounteous harvest. We give thanks for your blessings upon all of us here. Continue to bless us so that your grace may flow through us, allowing us to bear your fruit to a hungry world. As we wander, prune us of all that inhibits your growth in us. We beseech you to bestow your blessing upon all of us who share in the gift of the fruit of the vine and upon those who tend these fields now and forever. Amen. Amen, responded the harvest team 
as the bayonet decapitated the bottle with one swoop, Bluey barked and Paul poured champagne into plastic cups for all except Miguel and his crew, whom Sheila kept busy. Next, she called, showing Miguel which trees to cut, which nets to gather, which palms to scale and trim, which part of the riparian forest to clear. Picking was done in 90 minutes, but since the crew was contracted for half a day, Sheila kept them working. Next, feeding them generously two hours later. Let the feast begin, Paul announced over Bluey's barking, encouraging guests to eat. I've set out bottles of Grenache wine from previous years so you can experience how the wine develops with age. Be sure to take home some bottles as a thank you gift for your help. Give me a few minutes to organize things and we'll begin crushing grapes. And thanks to a suggestion from Marcy, everyone say hi to Marcy, he said pointing to her. We're going to stomp them with our bare feet. You mean, like I love Lucy? A volunteer asked. Yes, like Lucy, except please don't fall down. Grapes are slippery. Paul invited me to remove my shoes, but I declined, leaving this activity to the youngsters. He dumped four 40-pound lugs into an empty macro bin, combing through the bunches for any yellow jackets or honeybees. Steph, who showed up where there was champagne, started inspecting some bunches in the buckets and found a damaged cluster. Are you going to use this? Thanks for catching that, said Paul, who examined the fruit, noticed a hint of botrytis, smelled mustiness, and threw it into a container for rejects. We need volunteers to inspect the grapes before they go into the crusher, Paul told Steph, who rounded up some helpers. Who wants to stop? Paul shouted. I do, Marcy replied. Wash their feet, Sheila yelled from the base of a tall palm tree, supervising the aerobatic, acrobatic aerials of the trimmer. Paul took the hose, sprayed Marcy's feet with cool water on the driveway, Tal patted the tops, and gently massaged the bottoms dry, admiring the smooth skin of her tan legs and toenails the shade of grapes. He hosed the feet of the other ladies one by one, recalling the church service when the congregation watched each other's feet. The ladies sang, Ring Around the Rosie! and played traditional Italian dance music uh, from, from their phone that pleased the ears of the dog father. The grapes massaged and caressed their feet in ways they had never before been touched, and encouraged by the bubbly and the desire for more, they continued gently splitting the skins of grapes with their bare soles and toes. In Carrie Ann and Paul's winemaking class, Lum warned crushing grapes barefoot would scratch your feet, and recommended stomping with old shoes. So Paul cautiously stepped into the vat after rinsing. He was surprised how good it felt. Using shoes would have been like making love to Marcy in a raincoat. The contact of grapes to naked feet was as magical as when a couple comes together as one, flesh to flesh, bosom to bosom, and to be cherished. Paul put his arm around Marcy to support her so she wouldn't slip. When the stompers were spent, they stepped out of the bin, and Paul washed the seeds, skins, and juice from their feet. While he imagined licking residual grape juice from Marcy's legs, Bluey dreamt of gorging on a grape smorgasbord, the temptation so great, he jumped over the terrace railing in a single bound and dashed to slather Marcy. Paul rinsed her, seizing the opportunity to personally ensure Marcy's feet and legs were thoroughly dried by the towel in his hands. When organizing a crush, it's important to assign everyone a task. I need two volunteers, the ringmaster yelled, to wash buckets and containers. Don't let one drop of water trickle to the road, instructed Paul. When President Obama was here, I promised to keep water on our property in deference to EPA regulations to protect downstream wildlife and whales from grape juice. He showed them how the rinse over the ivy, dying from drought. Who wants to help crush grapes into the machine? There were several volunteers. He tried to involve neighborhood kids in the process to give them an experience they'd never forget. Whereas Janet counted the carrots of her harvest with the jeweler's precision, Paul simply counted the containers. By experience, he knew a lug of grapes weighs about 40 pounds, so 25 lugs are about 1,000 pounds and would yield a barrel of wine, plus extra wine for topping. Likewise, a five-gallon bucket weighed about 20 pounds, 
plus or minus. Although not as romantic as tiptoeing through the grapes with Marcy, once the crusher destemmer was operating, an entire macro bin could be filled with grape juice in half an hour. There was, there was a team to sort, led by Steph, a team of strong women and men led, led by Fagel to lift and empty lugs in the machine. Paul raised his hands to pull leaves before they passed through the machine. Quality control staff to pluck stems from the grape soup, someone to catch stems as they shot out the machine's rear, and washers who rinsed all buckets and containers that touched the sticky juice. While a half dozen or so people managed the crush, the rest, including Marcy, went inside to sample wine and a buffet suitable for a presidential visit. Paul filled several plastic cups with fresh grape juice, passing them around so everyone could taste the sweetest nectar on earth. Then he walked through the back door of the winery into the kitchen to fetch a block of ice frozen in a five gallon plastic water bottle to put into the building mound of must to keep the soup cool. He hadn't eaten all day and went to the dining room to stuff a handful of food into his mouth and noticed Marcy's wine glass filled to the rim. Hey, go easy on that. It's early in the morning and you need to drive. Yes, Dad. Keep that up and I'll have to drive you home. Would you? She smiled. The beat that skipped his heart throbbed behind his zipper. Be sure to eat plenty of food. I've got to get back outside. He gave her a gentle peck on the cheek and the skipping beat zapped her heart. Besides the allure of tasting fresh fruit from a juicy womb, Marcy was a fountain of youth, an alluring combination of energy, maturity, and st street smarts he didn't see in his daughter. I always thought Kate had a good head on her shoulders, and Carrie Ann said the same after counseling her about career choices, how to interview successfully, and how to navigate an office environment, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Some parents are blind to the good qualities of their children. While the queen of the vineyard sang songs of complaints, Marcy hung music of buoyant optimism, her songs vibrating harmonically with the middle-aged man's heartstrings pulling as much as the vines. What person of a certain age doesn't desire surrounding themselves with refreshing, wholesome youth? Paul enjoyed, anticipated, Long for the time each year, he could join Marcy and her friends in the pick bin, dancing the maypole, playing musical chairs, and ring around the rosy, ashes, ashes, all fall down into each other's arms in the bath of sweet syrup. Was it the massage to his feet from a hundred grape fingertips over the most sensitive skin of his body, or inspiration from a nymphette who rejuvenated Paul with her presence? Paul distracted by thoughts of his young muse, had forgotten to extract juice before it turned purple. Who wants to help make blush wine? He called. Oh, will you show me? Answered Marcy. I love rosé. And he led her from the dining room into the winery and gave her a clean white bucket and showed her how to place it against the side of the pick bin's wall so only rosebud colored juice entered without skins. Paul moved to the other side of the vat to gather juice and beheld the Grand Canyon as she bent over the bin. Embarrassed, he moved to her side to avoid exposure to the stunning view, each pouring their buckets of pink juice into a 32-gallon or white 32-gallon food grain container. They worked side by side, their magnetism bringing their bodies and furnaces and breaths closer. Paul, unaccustomed to the age of hookups, with two glasses of wine inside her, with a whisper to her ear, quicker than a bee diving into a vat of grape juice, she would have mounted him on the side of the pick bin, he sliding the cork into the bottle. After filling the container with sweet pink bliss, they went inside for a last taste of wine. This time, from a bottle of last year's blush, Paul poured for all to try paired with trays of smoked salmon, prosciutto, and cheeses. A ridiculous idea flashed through his mind, he leading Marcy by hand into the walk-in closet of his bedroom for a quickie, they emerging with blush flush faces. If we could talk ten hours on a flight from London, couldn't we travel around the world and do the round the world in the closet? 
She certainly had the energy for it, and her energy was contagious. Paul dismissed the thought and poured water into a kettle. After cups of strong-pressed coffee and a walk around the vineyard, Marcy and the other guests returned home safely with souvenir bottles of wine and, and without an exchange of bodily fluids. The vines called juice from their grapes bodily fluids, but that didn't count in Paul's mind. He drove to Escondido to purchase 20 pounds of dry ice to, fur to further cool the vat of reddening grape must. Back at the winery, he broke the blocks of dry ice into chunks and dropped them into the pig bin that bubbled and boiled freezing fog and pitched yeast into the container of pink juice to start fermentation. The next morning, when he and Bluey changed the ice and peeked, and peeked at the blushes' first signs of fermentation, Paul noticed a bee resting on a barrel. Lured by the scent of Earth's sweetest fruit, this flying ace forgot to check his fuel gauge, ran out of gas, and crash-landed inside the winery, whose doors were temporarily opened to welcome the grapes. If Miguel had found the bee, he would have backhanded it with a rolled-up newspaper. When Paul saw it, he repeated, When you save a bee, you save humanity. He observed the bee was tired and, and dripped fresh nectar into a beer bottle cap and placed it in front of the visitor, who, on its veritable last legs, inched towards the high-octane fuel and extended its straw. To be or not to be. A half hour later, recharged and radar rebooted, the pilot flew back to his hive, reported his miraculous adventure to the queen bee, who proclaimed to the working bee council that henceforth the bees would bless the generosity of people in the hidden hills and forgive the dog who sometimes lunged at them. Bees bivouacked en masse, floating as a black cloud, and flew over the hills towards blue Merle country. Children and adults dashed inside or dove into swimming pools to escape the attack. To the contrary, the bees flew in peaceful formation, led by the pilot who survived a night in a winery, telling the queen tales of nectar stored in vats that would fill a thousand hives. When they circled the winery, Bluey howled and Sheila shouted, Bees, get inside! But Paul stood and watched in amazement as the bee he rescued that morning landed on his shoulder. He had seen bees before and knew there was no danger so long as he didn't threaten the bivouac. Flush with his fill of fresh grape juice and espresso, his mind spinning around a sweet sugar high, he listened to symphonic humming. He and Sheila had planted almond trees that bloomed but beautiful pink blossoms each January, and yet there were no almonds. The next year, there were almonds galore, and even after the squirrels and rats and mice had their fill, there were enough almonds to feed Sheila and Paul for a year, thanks to the bees. Carrie Ann hired a beekeeper to set up hives to collect honey and started making cougar mead, which had notes of almond, lavender, and orange, and always sold out. The neighborhood's vegetable gardens produced in abundance. This goes to show what happened when a vintner showed mercy to a lonely bee. A week later, Paul used a siphon hose to rack the new blush wine into five-gallon glass carboys, admiring the pink hue. He poured a glass for himself that was surprisingly good. One week old wine, imagine that! He monitored the glass carboys the next week as the cloud of sediment settled. He racked the clear wine from the sediment and allowed it to settle another two weeks and bottled one of the carboys into clear bottles, a fresh, crisp blush wine without added sulfites. He brought a few bottles inside for he and Sheila to enjoy and drove a bottle to Marcy, since she had helped make it. Since their first meeting, Marcy had graduated from state and bootleggers and was working as a sales clerk for Barrels and Bottles, an artisanal shop that repurposed bottles, metal, and wine barrels into bookshelves, furniture, and fixtures. Paul loved their designs and made occasional visits to donate used bottles and barrels and drop off wine for Marcy. 
Paul met Marcy and the store's owner, who had recently traveled to Spain and was a big Tempranillo fan. Would you trade bookshelves for wine? Paul asked. A sip of the Tempranillo teleported the owner to a lively tapas bar in Spain, and he agreed to the deal, becoming another opportunity to visit Marcy to exchange wine, use bottles, and use barrels for repurposed furniture and bric-a-brac. Three days later, Paul loaded the vineyard mobile and returned to the shop with a case for the owner and a gift in a bottle for Marcy. Wow, I really like your hair, Paul told her. It's strikingly beautiful. She had dyed half her strands bright powder blue, the color of Bluey's logo, and Paul was smitten. Thanks, and thanks for the wine, she said. I'll open it at my new place. You moved? Yes, just the other day. A nicer apartment, not far from here in North Park. Cool. In that case, let me bring you a bottle of my best wine to celebrate. How about tomorrow? I'm free after work. Then it's settled. Happy hour tomorrow with the best wine ever made by a dog. Where shall we meet? My place is hard to find if you don't know where you're going. Meet me here first, then we'll head to North Park together. As he drove home on the 15, imagining the consummation of their friendship, he noticed the temperature gauge of his car exceeded 90 degrees, warm for October. At the entrance to Hidden Hills, he saw the red flags placed by the fire department to signal extreme fire danger. And as he reached the road summit, he saw a rising mushroom cloud on the horizon.